Hi, I'm James Gardner, host of Your History, Your Story, a podcast for everybody who loves stories about interesting people and events told by those who uncovered them from within their own family trees. This, we hope, will inspire you to discover and celebrate your history and your story. October 29th, 2022 marks the 10th anniversary of the day Superstorm Sandy came ashore in New Jersey. This epic storm, which was the greatest natural disaster in the history of the Jersey Shore, brought with it high winds, heavy rain, and a tidal surge, causing loss of life, power outages, and widespread destruction of property. One of the hardest hit areas along the coast was Long Beach Island in Ocean County. In this episode of Your History, Your Story, we will be speaking with Scott Mazzella, author of the national award-winning book, Surviving Sandy, Long Beach Island, and the Greatest Storm of the Jersey Shore. Scott, a New Jersey resident, educator, former reporter, and passionate weather buff, will tell us about Superstorm Sandy from its early formation to its devastating landfall. He'll also be sharing stories about Long Beach Islanders who survived the storm and worked tirelessly together with volunteers from all around the country to rebuild and restore the Jersey Shore. I'd now like to welcome Scott Mazzella to our show. Welcome, Scott. Hi, thanks. Glad to be here. Well, we're glad to have you. And I'm going to start off, Scott, by asking you to tell us about yourself. Where were you born and raised? I'm a Jersey guy. I was born in Red Bank, New Jersey, raised in Matawan, New Jersey, Old Bridge, New Jersey, kind of between the two. And uh, I've been here my whole life, never left Jersey. You're a fellow Jerseyan, so I'm with you on that. Tell us about some of your early interests growing up. What kind of things did you like to do for fun? Did you like sports? Did you have any hobbies or things like that? I was kind of, I always tell people I'm kind of like a geek, right? Like uh, I loved weather, which I'm sure we'll talk about, uh, but cars too. My dad worked for General Motors. So I grew up in a GM family. He worked at a, uh, an assembly plant in Linden. It was like our second home. So I love cars. We went to car shows auto shows and got all that insider track information and i was a kid with all the car brochures everywhere but eventually weather caught me even more and history too i was probably you know one of the few kids in uh, my middle school who was checking out local history books about the town i live in because i was just so amazed at what used to be where everybody lives or what used to be where the shopping centers are and such so you know, that's uh, some of it. So the, the geekery, right? <laughs> oh, definitely. When we talk about weather, uh, we often, inter- it's interchangeable with history, really, because we've got so many different weather events that have happened over uh, the history of this country. And in New Jersey itself, we've had a lot of different weather events. And, you know, people's lives are intertwined with weather. You know, it's, we, hey, we, we all live weather. We all, that's what we all have in common, right? We experience the weather. And that's why people say, hey, it's a nice day today. Or, you know, when you're passing somebody in conversation, we talk about weather. But when we have a big weather event, like what we're going to talk about, that really does tie into our history and it makes the history books. So you liked local history. And uh, did you have other areas of interest with history? Uh, I really love like the provincial history and U.S. history. I've always been a fan of how our nation formed in you know, the early days. My wife and I joke. Uh, we must have been a part of the 1700s in Philadelphia. Like we swear that we had a life there back in the day because we just both love it so much. There's something romantic and fun about those early days. But I don't, I don't know how it happened. I, I think good teachers, my social studies teachers growing up, just put that spark out there and I grabbed it and I never stopped. And now I teach social studies in the middle school level. So it's it's kind of come full circle. And that's why I love my job so much because it's like a hobby that I've been doing forever and I get paid for it now. And you get paid for doing what you love. When you talk about teachers, the importance of teachers, it is so critical that teachers teach something that they love because it's contagious. I know when I was in school, I had some teachers who I didn't feel like they wanted to be there. Then there were other teachers I could tell, man, they were passionate about what they were talking about. And they're the ones I remember. And they're the ones who sparked my interest in history. So 
you're apparently one of those teachers. And I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of kids in the future who are, as adults are going to say, I remember Mr. Mazzella. He really sparked my interest. I loved it when he talked about weather. <laughs> We're all doing our best. You really got to love it to do it for any long period of time. So if you get the teacher that's been there, you know, five, 10 years, they, they got to love doing it. Otherwise it's an impossible job without that spark. So. <laughs> Yeah. So let's talk about the weather piece of it, though. I know my brother, when he was a teenager, my parents would get him weather equipment, like little, like a barometer and a thermometer and one of those wind gauge things. And he used to like to study the maps, weather maps and the newspapers and things like that. Did you do stuff like that? You know what? For me, it was the weather channel, classic weather channel. And anyone who knows weather knows what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like late 80s, early 90s, John Hope doing Tropical Update, Jim Cantori with hair, you know, like uh, the original Weather Channel crew and those 10 minute local forecasts where you got about two seconds of pixelated radar. And that's what we like, we lived on. My buddy and I, we followed storms. We would wait, we'd run outside, look at the sky, come back in, look, wait for the radar, go back out, come back in. It was like, there was no instant anything. There was no cell phones or anything. We we're lucky to have cable with a weather channel to check anything out on. I didn't really get to use the internet until I was in college. And I was amazed that you could look up radars anytime you want. That's like one of the first things I did as soon as I found out about the internet. I'm like, oh, 24 hour radars. I could look at this all day. You know, it was so exciting. Um, so in a summer camp, I must, it must have been like kindergarten or first grade. I remember looking out the window, it was a big storm. We all had to go inside. The teacher's like, get away from the windows. And I'm standing at the window, looking out the window. This is in Marlboro, New Jersey. And a bolt of lightning just went right down. And I was just, I wasn't scared. I was fascinated, just fascinated. And my dad used to take us in the garage and watch lightning too, which was uh, fun. I guess a lot of things steered me in this direction right from the beginning. Who knows why, but here we are. Yeah, here we are. Now, there was a book that you really enjoyed, and it was called... Mm -hmm. The Great Storms of the Jersey Shore. Can you tell us yeah. about that book? Who are the authors and what did that book mean to you? The authors are Larry Savadov and, and Margaret Thomas Buchholz, two LBI authors, Long Beach Island authors. I got this book from my mother for my 16th birthday. It was a brand new book, 1993. And Senator Bradley, I can't remember if it was the Ford or the introduction, but he wrote one of them. And uh, she chased him down on one of his famous annual beach walks mm -hmm. to sign the book. So he signed, he inscribes the book and gives it to me as a 16th birthday present. I'm just like, wow, look at this. First of all, it's a huge book. It's basically the New Jersey storm Bible, the Jersey shore storm Bible. I just poured over this thing. Like it was the best thing ever, you know, um, since I love weather, just going through the books, the graphics, the pictures, the, the writing, of course, was phenomenal. Just all that data in there. And I, I remember thinking at the time, wow, this is so cool because we never had anything of that kind of significance weather-wise at the Jersey Shore up until that point when I was 16. I had never experienced anything. So little did I know that twice my age later, I would. So I just loved that book. Other kids are reading comics or riding bikes around. I'm, I'm reading this book. I'm watching the radars. We, I grew up spending my whole summer on Long Beach Island every summer, and I would be watching the clouds in the western horizon. I would be looking at that barometer. I would be, like, waiting for storms, and this book helped make that happen. That's great. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's a, a certain teacher or teachers who uh, spark an interest and passion and encourage you in something. Sometimes it's a book like this one that draw you toward your interest and give you more information that it really fuels the fire for your interest, right? Absolutely. And when you're young, you don't even know it. You don't realize it until you reflect back that you're like, aha, it was the teachers and, and the experiences and all that all along. You know, uh, what do they say? Youth is wasted on the young. You know, yes. you don't think about it there. <laughs> uh, although I did get starstruck because I ended up becoming a journalist and I had a summer job at the paper where those two authors, uh, Larry and Margaret, worked. And I was just starstruck when I met them. So that was pretty cool. They got a chance to thank Margaret and Larry. They did the introduction of my book, Surviving Sandy. That was an honor for me. Bet that was. 
let's start to talk about Superstorm Sandy and how that storm sort of sparked a, it was a culmination of all your interests and actual experience that you had with the storm. Tell us, where were you and what were your thoughts and feelings back in late October 2012 when Superstorm Sandy hit the New York City area? We'll call this a metamorphosis from the guy who couldn't wait to experience something like this <laughs> to the guy who fully understands the weight of an experience like this for everybody involved and, and how much pain it brings. So I had started a Facebook page, Jersey Shore Storms, and I used to just update it when something big was coming along, like if there was some hurricane that might look like it was for me. I just did it for fun. And I started getting a little bit of a following and people started trusting what I was saying, right? And, you know, hurricane seasons would come and go, regular severe thunderstorm warnings, things like that I would put up there, the snowstorms I would put up there. So it would be exciting for a little while and then the storm would come and go. But then here comes what's going to be Sandy, 10 days ahead of time. This Euro model comes up and shows this crazy storm center right off the Jersey shore heading into it. I, I almost fell off my chair. I was like, that, that's the very scenario that the army Corps of engineers, I, because of my geek stuff. Again, I was going to army Corps of engineers presentations about hurricanes when I was in my teens, <laughs> my mom would drop me off, and pick me up. <laughs> but they always said the perpendicular hit is going to be the, the worst case scenario. But then I would also say, but don't worry, that never happens. Okay, So here in this model is that exact scenario. And I'm going, oh, my God. So the next day at school, I, I emailed the science teacher, my buddy, uh, Dan Sullivan, and then run to his room because I, I couldn't wait to talk about this. So <laughs> we're just like, this is not really going to happen. This is like one of those early models that you're just like, oh, my God. But then it changes. Right. But what happened instead was all the other models started to come to this one. And you could see as the week, when we first started telling people, they're like, they totally brushed us off. Then as the week advanced, more of the news media started picking it up. And then people started coming to me like, well, what do you think's going to happen? You know, in fact, my, I told my dad who he lived up, up in central Jersey. He didn't live at the beach house in, on Long Beach Island. You should go down and, you know, prepare for this storm, you know, take things inside. I was working. I couldn't go down. He, he was retired. So. Uh, he enlisted my brother's help, and uh, he listened to me. I don't know if it was my tone or the certainty in my voice, but he did it. He went down and he uh, prepared the house. But as we got really close, then everything, you know, then you started seeing the hype machine kick in and then the Frankenstorm names and, and all these crazy things. And I'm sitting here on my little Jersey Shore Storms Facebook page, like updating constantly. Now I feel like people are listening and I want to give them good information. I'm, I'm passing along. If I don't make information, I pass information along to the National Hurricane Center and stuff like that. And it's just building and building and building and building. And here comes the day, right? And I am excited. I'm going to experience this. This is happening. The wind starts kicking up. I'm like, oh, yeah. Now I'm not down the shore. I'm in central Jersey. We're like actually staying with my dad at the time. My daughter had just been born. I was between houses. And we're with him. He lives in a development with tons of trees. So it's, you know, the wind mm -hmm. starting up. It's just like, whoa, wow, cool. And you're starting to get a little nervous when you live in a development full of trees when a yes. storm like that is coming in. Because now you're hearing creaking and whatever. But somehow I'm calm through the whole thing. And it gets dark out. And it's time to put the kids to bed. My kids were really little. So they go to sleep. <laughs> but I'm like, finally, I could focus on the storm. I sit down to watch some news because I want to see some local coverage. I see a flash out the window, the transformer, blew, the wire blew off of it, and the whole house goes dark. Just as I sat down, I was like, ah. <laughs> so I have nothing now. I have no internet. I have no way to know what's going on. My phone service is spotty at best. So now I'm just riding the storm and the wind. When you have no power, that's when you really hear the wind. You do. Even my dog didn't want to go outside, but they sensed what was going on. Now, we are concerned more about the beach house at this point because – who knows what's going to happen? Is there storm surge coming in? Like, is there major flooding? And now I have no way to check because I have no internet or anything. And, and, you know, power, we didn't know at the time the power is going to be out for a couple of weeks. I'm scrambling to, to get some image through my phone of LBI the next morning. And we get this one shot that just shows Holgate on Long Beach Island covered with sand 
from end to end, just like in the 62 Nor'easter, which couldn't believe it. I was like, is our house even there? Because they were showing some of the houses around where my parents live had collapsed. And like they just fell like and they're covered in sand. I just couldn't believe it. But my brother worked for the police department. So some of his workers had sent a picture to us of the house. So it was still standing, but it looked like it was leaning a little, which was kind of weird. We found out later it's because the foundation was washed out on one side. It survived, but just by a little bit. It wouldn't be for like a couple of weeks before my dad and I could get down there to see it because they weren't letting people down there. But in terms of where I was up in central Jersey, when we woke up the next morning, my dad's property was fine. All the leaves were up the trees, which was crazy because they were all, you know, it looked like fall the day before. And we went for a walk around the development and the, the huge trees that had fallen everywhere. There were so many trees down blocking roads. One tree went right through someone's top of their house, right through the middle. They had to move out. I couldn't believe the power of these trees when they fall. And a lot of the local parks and stuff were closed for months because they had so many trees down. So that part was crazy in the immediate area. Our biggest problem for us was just not having electricity. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was cold. I don't know if you remember, it snowed not too long after Sandy. Yeah, I do remember that. <laughs> like to make matters worse, right? And then my daughter was only a few months old and we're trying to keep her warm all night and it's cold. And uh, we decided to go visit a friend in Delaware and stay with them for a couple of nights just so the kids could be warm. But when we got down the shore and just saw some people who lost everything or where all their stuff was gone, that it became less fascinating and more just sad at that point. That's the truth, the metamorphosis, right? And then I saw how much my parents had to do to just fix their house. Massive amount of time it took to do that. If you told me 10 years later, we'd still be talking about people dealing with the storm and the effects, I'd be like, no way, but we absolutely are. Like you, I experienced the high wind and then, of course, losing power. We were out about six days, I think. We actually fared pretty well with the power. But one of the things I remember was the, you know, in the dark, just hearing that high wind up against the house and just worrying about the large oak trees that surrounded us. Of course, when we went out the next day or a day and a half later, we just saw dozens and dozens of large trees downed and houses with you know, trees through the roof and things like that. It's definitely a scary experience, even away from the water and further north and west. So let me talk about this part of it now. So you experienced the storm. You're a weather enthusiast. Uh, you saw the tragedy that came afterward. What inspired you to write your book, Surviving Sandy? That was through the publisher. I had met the owner of Down the Shore Publishing, a, a regional publishing house in West Creek, New Jersey. They were connected with the newspaper I was working with, relationship connected, not directly connected. And we had maintained uh, a friendship through social media, actually. His wife and I, and he and I, and they knew about my love of weather because they had joined that Facebook page and they know I talk about weather all the time. They knew I was up in central Jersey, not at the shore. Now, the storm comes through. It destroyed their entire office and all their books that were stored there. It destroyed a whole bunch of their inventory. The surge came in because their offices were on the bay. It destroyed the bottom half of their house. They first, I think, thought maybe the original authors of Great Storms of the Jersey Shore would be interested in doing it. But they were all dealing with damage. Plus, they had kind of not shown as much interest in doing that. So between the damage and a little bit less interest, he thought of me and he gave me a call and he said, you know, he knew I was living up in central Jersey. You're up there. You're not rebuilding a house and your parents' house in Holgate. That's your parents are taking care of that. You may be in a position to help us. You know, one of those calls, mm -hmm. right? So he asked me to write a book. He says, we have to journalize this. We have to document it. You know, people might say right away, like, why are you doing this? Trying to make a book right after Sandy, but this is history. Somebody owes it to all these people that are suffering to document it for the future. He said, meet me down in Holgate. And this was, this was late December. He called me and then we went down and met in Holgate in early January. And so it was a evening time. It was like a golden time, right? With the, the sun starting to set. And we're going through debris. 
we're looking under roofs where houses collapsed. It looks like a war zone. And he's getting hit. I'm, I was already emotionally hit because I had been there already once with my dad. So it just took him like, he's like, yeah, we, we need to do this. So we, so we went down to a local tavern, a uh, restaurant, Buckaloo's in a beach haven. And he said, we're doing this. Do you want to write this book? And I said, sure. And we shook hands like old style. And then I was like, oh my God, I never wrote a book before, <laughs> you know, but um, it's like, you just say yes and you go. Because what an opportunity for me to write something like this. I know myself and I trusted myself as somebody who would do it for the right reasons and, and do it the right way. It was never like about making money. Uh, it was just about doing this to do it. I was inspired by books about storms. And now I had the chance to write something that somebody else might learn something from. You know, what an opportunity that was. They knew I was a little bit nervous because I had never done that. And they said, don't worry, we're going to, we got a team of people helping you. And I try to say in every interview, it's my name on the cover, but it is a team of people holding me up. And I could not have done any of it without them. I think we put out something really special, something that'll stand up through time. We had so many people that read the book. It came out the year after Sandy. We tried to get it out for the one year anniversary. Some people emotionally said they did not expect to revisit Sandy so thoroughly. It felt like they were right back there. Mm. And part of me felt bad because I didn't want them to feel bad. But part of me was like, we nailed it. You know, we got it. We captured that lightning in the bottle. We got the story straight because we let the people tell the story. Like when I first started writing the book, I wrote it like a history book because I teach U.S. history. So I wrote it like it was the past. Mm -hmm. I was kind of too focused on what somebody 200 years from now would think rather than what somebody two years from now would think. And my editor, Steve Warren, when he read it, I was, I couldn't wait to hear what he said. I was so excited. I had done all this weather stuff, you know, building up the storm, explaining it all. And he goes, you love weather. I'm like, yeah, he knows. And then he's like, I was bored after the second chapter. And I was like, what? Brought me right down to earth. <laughs> but he goes, you are writing this like a history book. And I'm like, but it's history. He goes, no, everyone's alive. He's like, don't write it like everybody's dead. You know, like write it like a narrative. I was like, write it like a narrative. And he goes, write it like a narrative. And he went through the steps with me, how to take certain parts of the story and let certain people tell certain parts. So I put a huge poster board in the room I was writing and I kind of, It looked like a madman scientist, right? Names, parts of stories. This person's going to come in here. No, I can't do that. Switching it around. That change, that getting it out of my head and onto a space on the wall made the whole story open up. It was like a forensic narration of Sandy. It worked because at the end, the right people were telling the right parts of the story at the right time. It just worked out so great. And again, that's because of a team effort. That's Steve Warren telling me to do that. He was there with me the whole time, you know, because I'm teaching all day and right in at night. I guess he could tell when uh, it was crunch time at school because he'd be like, were you sleeping when you wrote this? And I'd be like, I think I actually was. <laughs> you know, I'm writing like late at night and he'd be like, do it again. I tell my students that all the time. I'm like, if you get mad at me writing like one little thing on your paper in the real world, you have people saying, you know, this whole thing stinks. Do it again. It's life. And I experienced that. So it actually helps me be a better teacher going through these experiences too. So I'm proud of it even 10 years later, or I guess nine years later, and uh, I hope it stands the test of time. Well, you should be proud of it, Scott, because it is a very um, riveting account. And I'm just going to talk about the book just a bit so people can get a flavor for it and why I found it so interesting. Just briefly, I noticed one of the things you start with is you talk about a couple of other storms that hit the Long Beach Island area. First of all, can you tell us, for those people who are outside of the New Jersey, New York area, where is Long Beach Island and what does it kind of look like? Long Beach Island's a narrow barrier island off of Ocean County, New Jersey. So its southern tip is about 15 miles north of Atlantic City. Its northern tip is most famous for its lighthouse, Barnegat Lighthouse, which you see in a lot of New Jersey commercials. It's the red and white lighthouse. And it's about 15 miles south of Seaside Heights. So it's 
completely detached from New Jersey. Like you, the only way you could get there is by a, the one bridge that goes on and off, or if you take a boat. So that's where it's located. Okay. So Scott, Long Beach Island is largely a summer vacation island, but there are people who live there year round. Would you be able to give us some feel for like how many people would be there during the peak summer season versus in late October when Hurricane Sandy hit? Well, summertime, you're talking like wall to wall people. Yeah. Uh, it's an 18 mile long island. It's uh, unlike the outer banks of the Carolinas that have some space between houses. Mm -hmm. There's hardly any space between the houses on any of the Jersey Shore towns up and down the coast and that Long Beach Island included. So in peak summer season, I mean, you're talking probably tens of thousands of people, if not more, and people always coming and going because you, you also have day trippers. So you increase your amount of people on the island pretty drastically during the day when people are driving over to go to the beach versus people staying there for vacation. But um, it stays pretty busy until the Chowder Fest in like mid-October. After Chowder Fest, it's like, let's turn the lights off. That's when the street lights go from red, green, blue to just blinking yellow. Just blinking. It's like all the locals go, ah, you know. When Sandy comes in late October, you're kind of near minimum population numbers. Although over the last 20 years, more and more people have decided to retire down there. When I was a kid, when we could visit my parents' shore house in the winter, it felt like we were on the frontier. I mean, tumbleweed in the streets. You'd see maybe one other person. Right. Uh, it was almost uncomfortable when you're a kid. You're like, there's nobody here, you know. As an adult, we had a few neighbors that stayed there all year. But when I say minimums, you're, I mean, it's not completely barren anymore. There are people living there. So Long Beach Island was a, is a barrier island. It's long and narrow. And uh, certainly, you can imagine it could be very susceptible to a, a major storm that would be coming you talk in your book just briefly about a couple storms, one that hit in 1944 and another one in 1962. So those were big storms. How would they have lined up against Superstorm Sandy? I'd put them up there with Sandy. When I do my book talks around the state, I like to tell people, you know, there's certain storms that reset the clock because they do so much damage to the point where you may not even recognize the place when they rebuild afterwards because so much is different based on the damage that the storm caused. 44 is one of those resets, especially for the southern end of Long Beach Island, mm -hmm. where it just obliterated that whole section. I mean, there are only probably a dozen or more houses left on that one. I mean, they were digging people bodies out like that. That was a bit of a shocker of a, a storm. It didn't even hit directly. It was offshore, but it sent a storm surge, which people at the time described as a tidal wave going over the entire width of the island all the way to the mainland and then coming back and it just obliterated the place so if you like for instance if you saw my parents street like if you look in a history uh, book and see a picture of my parents street there's no houses that are there from 44 or earlier because they just were wiped out so i call that like that's a chapter right and then after that they built other houses from 44 to 62 and while there's other storms 62 is like the next benchmark storm and that would be actually the benchmark storm for a long time. But 62, you had a lot of capes, right? On little foundations, some houses on piles, especially here and there on the, on directly on the beach. Uh, but 62 storm, that was a three day nor'easter. That wasn't even a hurricane. Just that incessant northeast wind that just pushes water into the back bays, fills them up like bathtubs. They start to overflow. The dune line gets eaten away, and before long, you have a high tide with uh, waves making their way much farther inshore than they would have because the water's higher, so it's like riding along top, and it's hitting houses and moving houses, and it just did that for three days until it just like ate from one side of the LBI to the other, uh, including my parents' house, which popped off the foundation and spun around and went across the street. 62 is the storm that completely blew my mind as a kid. I was so fascinated with that. I wished I could go back in time and see what that would have was, was like to just see that kind of reset happen. Little did I know growing up that that would happen again. 50 years of the 62 storm. The timing is just crazy. That's right. Um, but that was a big 50 years because you had storms, but you had, you know, relatively few massive, nothing as massive as 62. 
nothing like Sandy, but you have that storm. And then you had a building storm, a boom of real estate development along the Jersey shore. So now you had a few generations in that 50 years of people who had no clue what 62 storm is or what it could do. So Scott, let me ask you this question. When hurricane, initially hurricane Sandy, what became super storm Sandy hit the Jersey shore, what kind of things happened? What were the components of that system, such as storm surge and winds? What, what kind of things were we talking about there, Scott? Well, you had what's, what was essentially a dying hurricane. I'm glad you said Hurricane Sandy first, because a lot of people forget that it did a lot of damage and a lot of lives were lost in Jamaica. But as it came up, it, it was so late in the season. It was late October. Now we're kind of setting up for a winter weather pattern. There's a blocking high pressure system over the Canadian Maritimes. You have your low pressures diving into the Ohio River Valley. And Sandy, Hurricane Sandy, was going right into that and had nowhere to go. It couldn't go north because of that blocking high. It missed any opportunity to do that. But the water temperature underneath Sandy was so cold that it couldn't sustain itself as a hurricane. So it starts to die. And when a hurricane starts to die, all those winds that were tightly wound in that center start to spread out over a much larger fetch of sea. This is where we have our problem because if it's not going to go north or east and out to sea, that low pressure system over in the Ohio River Valley is going to act like a little turbocharger and grab it and pull it towards the west. And that was that was your worst case scenario because it actually would have been better if Sandy had come in earlier as a hurricane and barreled into Brigantine. It would have destroyed Brigantine and uh, parts north, like maybe the halfway up in the LBI, but then it would have been limited to that area. But instead the wind field was over a huge fetch of ocean. And it's like a person standing at the side of a swimming pool, pushing water towards the side, you know, it's gonna just go up and over the side and that was the whole Jersey Shore in Long Island. That, that was the side of the pool. So that storm is pushing all that energy, all that water ahead of time. So now you start to see, like 62, all that water coming into the back bays. It's all up and down the shore north of about Ocean City. And it's just going up and up and up. So everyone was expecting a hit on the day they said it's going to make landfall. But they were shocked to see how much flooding was the morning before landfall or even the morning of the landfall, because now you had water came up through the storm drains, up over the bay bulkheads and flooding town to the point where people had to be rescued by jet ski because the, the trucks couldn't get through. So, you know, low tide, would it would drop a little, but for the most part, it had nowhere to go. It's just going to go higher and higher every high tide. That's pre-storm surge. So now you have Sandy, which is no longer a tropical system at all. That's why the forecasters were saying, what do we name this? Somebody, some journalist said Superstorm Sandy, and the forecasters seemed to like that name versus the Frankenstorm name. They had a hard time telling people what the heck this was. They couldn't issue any hurricane warnings or watches because the computer system at the National Weather Service would not allow you to do that if there wasn't a hurricane. So they're putting up nor'easter type warnings, gale warnings, and people don't take those as seriously all the time as like a hurricane coming, you know? So here you have Sandy now, whatever's left of Sandy pushing in and the, the center comes in right around Brigantine. And it now is bringing a surge with it. Like you mentioned, the storm surge, which is now on top of all that flooding. Right. And all those dunes, the big dunes were eaten away all day long by those waves ahead of time and they were gone. So now the surge comes and hits what? Hits what's behind the dunes. Those are houses. Those are beachfront homes. And they're going to blast through garages they're going to blast through first floors and all that debris is going to like shrapnel is going to go right through the houses behind it and that's all going to continue all the way to the mainland so we saw what looked like tornado damage on mainland houses you know the bay communities on the mainland because they weren't just getting storm surge they were getting storm surge with debris in it and then it all comes back you know as it, it recedes that's why all the sand made it from the shore all the way to the bay and a lot went into the bay they had problems with the bay and being too shallow after sandy too because that sand went in there junk went in there pieces of houses went in there so it fundamentally changed the landscape even though if you look at the bay it looks the same so uh it's just a scary scary scenario in the book we talk about how one of the mayors was just heard the noise and saw the water just blast down the ends of the road and come right into town. 
much to his shock, like uh, stories of people, you know, caught off guard by the storm surge up and down. But I will say if in 1962, if LBI was like the epicenter of the 62 storm, the, the place that got it really the worst was probably Manilokin for Sandy and uh, Seaside Heights for Sandy. Nobody wants to see this kind of damage, but it, it happens. And you know, we all saw the, the pictures and stuff from those places. Shocking stuff. Absolutely. You had a surge earlier, which wore away the dunes, which wore away the protection against the storm. So now when the surge came in, do you know approximately how many feet that surge was at that time? We know that in terms of like ultimate height, we're talking like four to five feet, but I don't have a direct number for how high the surge itself was in any particular area. But if you picture four to five feet of flooding and then a surge on top of that, you know, that brief period, people always think it's from zero to surge, like a tidal wave coming in. But you have pre-flooding with the surge on top. So even if it doesn't sound like that impressive a number, you now have water moving over water, not like water hitting land. So it's not breaking up till it hits something that's a house, you know, like a wave hitting a house, your house doesn't stand a chance. No, no, not unless at all. It, unless you have breakaway walls on the bottom floor and it's hitting piles. That's a different, that's why they make breakaway walls. So what about the wind, Scott? Uh, what kind of wind speed are we talking about? LBI in Atlantic city had the highest wind gust. I think Atlantic city had a 91 mile an hour wind gust sustained though at the shore, you had some 80 mile per hour sustained winds mm. and that's dangerous, right? When you have that incessant wind at that, that speed. We're up in central Jersey, North Jersey. You had gusts that got that high, but not sustained winds Correct. that high. But they that did enough damage because there were millions of trees down and all those power lines down. So that did a whole different type of damage in North Jersey and, and central Jersey. Exactly. Uh, where it took weeks to repair. It did. So in your book, you tell some really, really riveting stories about survival and people's experiences, people who stayed on the island, uh, either to protect their property or whether they were there as an emergency, in an emergency capacity. Can you give us a couple quick snippets of examples of stories that are in your book? I love telling the Charlie Potter story. Um, he was somebody who tried to stay in Holgate. He was renting a ranch size house, uh, one of the few ranches on a foundation down there. But the house flooded far ahead of the storm. He was a survivalist, like he was all prepared with food and water. He still had to leave because it, it didn't matter if the house was flooding up to the, the roof. So he walked to town in the storm. Eventually, a National Guard truck picked him up and took him to where he worked, which was the, uh, the Seashell uh, Motel, uh, which had a very popular bar area, outdoor pool, tiki, all that stuff. So he's in there and the, he's with the bartender and they, they're riding out the storm and they're getting word that water is coming into the dining area where the bar is and that some of the outlets might be getting salt water. So they're concerned about a fire. So they're going down to the bar and moving some beer coolers to, to check the outlets. And these beer coolers are full of beer because it was supposed to be a fishing tournament the weekend before and they're still stocked pretty good. And uh, they're you know moving these heavy beer coolers there doing their thing when the storm surge hits and it goes right over the pool area, right through the tiki bars. And, and they had a wall of windows of where the bar was. I can only imagine what that must look like the blast of glass mm -hmm. and water coming in and whirled both of them around and moved the beer coolers and trapped them both under beer coolers. And, and now the water's going over their faces. Uh, Charlie Potter said he was scared. He was going to die. He thought he was going to drown right there because the water kept going over his, head and he's stuck underneath this beer cooler is he can't get his foot out so the beach haven fire department was right across the street at the angleside hotel which was a little higher up and had a seawall in front of it so they were actually in pretty good shape and somebody screamed for help and they came and they got the two guys out and they had to cut the this big heavy oak bar off which in retrospect they're, they're lucky to be alive being trapped under not only the beer cooler but broken glass and pieces of bar and being that they were the only ones in there that got someone heard them call for help and got help. He, he survived. So we had one family that was, that felt safe at home, but they watched as a, a live wire fell in front of their house and into the water. And they could still see the blue light bouncing under the water. And they were afraid wow. to go to their garage to get food because there's this wire outside and the water's right coming right into the garage. 
are they going to get electrocuted? Uh, not to mention a gas main broke right near that, and they were worried the two were going to blow. <laughs> These kind of crazy things, you know, you never think about the utilities being the thing that might get you. Fortunately, in that case, nobody got hurt. My own neighbor, they stayed, and they just said how as the day went up and went on, uh, water slowly rose. I, I love this visual. They said, well, we saw a flower pot go by. You know, some little yard tchotchkes go floating by. And as the day went, everything got bigger, like logs, pieces of wood, garbage cans, and then front doors and washing machines. You know, eventually they watched as uh, their own car was taken from the driveway and plopped on a neighbor's porch. It's now trying to take their Lexus out of the garage. The water's flooding everywhere. And, they, and the husband, who was pretty elderly at the time, tried to go down to... Uh, do something. I guess you have this feeling like, well, we got to try something to save our stuff, open the front door or something or let pressure out. I don't know what he was thinking, but it was so bad that he almost got sucked out of his house. Like it took his pants. He got back upstairs, but he almost didn't get out of that uh, rush of water coming from ocean to bay. Another neighbor stayed, Carl and Susan Clark, who took the famous picture on the front of the cover of the book. They watched a house come up the street, like bounce off telephone poles and grab their Ford edge and take it with them as the house went to a bayfront lot and plopped itself down and car right in front looked like the house and the car were there the entire time. They were scared to death through a lot of it. And they went out the next morning, walked on four feet of sand and took some great pictures of look like an apocalypse. This was just the, the resort part of LBI. Uh, so we have a lot of that kind of stuff. The pictures, I was, I was going to talk about the pictures. You've got so many amazing photographs in there. And I, there's pictures that were taken during the storm, that, but there's a lot taken after the storm showing the destruction. Now, our church did some relief work in Staten Island on Thanksgiving. So it was a month later. And we were in Staten Island, and there were homes in the middle of the road that had been washed into the middle of the road, there was wreckage and debris everywhere. There were stores. You look in storefronts and there were shelves of cans and stuff just all over the floor. There was water. Things were sort of festering, you know, mold starting to grow. It's just, it was terrible. So I see by the pictures in your book that it was the same type of situation. There were boats piled up. There was homes moved. So just, if you could just tell us, how did you get all these photographs? How, what was the process of collecting and sorting through and choosing the photographs for this book? A lot of people will say, I love the pictures. You took such great pictures. I'm like, I didn't take any of the pictures in the book. People just sent them. Like we had a call out, you know, please send your pictures. A lot of people knew this publisher from a, their book, Great Storms of the Jersey Shore that I was talking about earlier. Now here is their chance to send their picture in and maybe get in a storm book. So we have lots of people send pictures. And thanks to digital pictures, it's easy to send them through the computer. So we had lots of submissions. And our publisher, Ray Fisk, he literally went through them to see which ones would fit best with the narrative we were working on. Now, we, we had such a short timeline. We had about six months to do this from writing to sending it to the printer. So we were all doing different things at the same time. Like I wasn't worried about pictures. I was worried about the narrative and the writing. Uh, Ray was doing the pictures. Leslie was doing the layout to see what pictures would fit where. You know, we had so many submissions of pictures. Uh, we were lucky because we got a lot of great ones because with that many pictures, there were bound to be some really, really good ones. And I actually fought really hard to get the cover shot where it was because I really felt that that summed up sandy well but it was taken with a cell phone which had some resolution issues but it looked great to, on the cover i think it really just encapsulates what that storm did you know uh, the sand the car torn apart uh, the houses torn apart the raging ocean which is still going on the morning after i have to thank all the people that sent pictures because what's not in the book i mean we have piles of pictures things that didn't make the book one funny thing we got over and over and over again were people sending pictures of great storms of the Jersey Shore underwater. People loved showing us that the storm book was destroyed by a storm. 
<laughs> so we, <laughs> we got so many of them. Like, look, there's your storm book in the water. And they go nicely with the stories there that you've highlighted a couple, but there's a lot of stories in there and it's very well written and it's very intriguing to find out you know, what was going on. What, what about people trying to save people? You spend part of the book, obviously, talking about the rescue process and and h- how big of an effort it was to not only rescue, but rebuild Long Beach Island. Well, after that storm, I didn't know how they were going to do it, to be honest. I knew they'd done it before, but I thought it was going to be, I really thought it was going to be the end for some places, or at least a slowdown of building, like in Holgate, for instance, the southern tip of LBI. Once again, the massive amount of damage from a storm. After the 62 storm, there were people calling for a moratorium on building. I thought, this is going to do it. They're going to say no. But instead, we have seen a resurgence of building like I've never seen. And not just building. I'm talking huge million-dollar houses. Like, incredible. They've built massive, massive houses. I'm not a big fan of that. But, hey, if there's buyers for it, they're going to build it. The complete opposite from what I thought was going to happen happened. Building became bigger, faster, and more prevalent all up and down the Jersey Shore. The tough part that, um, you know, are the people who live there full time. That's not their vacation house. That's not a corporate owned house or something like that is their house. And they, maybe they didn't have flood insurance, you know, and what do they do now? Maybe they did have flood insurance and they had to fight tooth and nail. What if uh, they had, they got federal aid from the government and now They spent it, fixed their house, and now the government's saying, I want 50,000 back. What do you do? They were victims of a storm. You have people who are traumatized and can't stand the thought of a storm anymore. There's also all sorts of of impacts it has had, not to mention the infrastructure problems, you know, that have had to be fixed. Uh, In the immediate aftermath of the storm, I must say that what I like to call the frontier mayors of the Jersey Shore, the last of the We'll do what we want, mayors, you know, that you see almost in movies only now. They got things done because they didn't wait for red tape. Maybe they sh- they were supposed to wait for the EPA to approve removing all the trash that they could, but they just did it. They hired trucks and got it done. They pulled those streets and got it done. They braced houses that lost all their bottom walls. They got it done because they learned from previous generations. They, some of them were there in 1962 or there like a uh, mayor mancini in long beach township his, his father was the mayor in 62 and he remembered his dad bracing all the houses so they got in there and got that stuff done <laughs> i don't know if anywhere else in in the new Jer- in new jersey would have been able to get that kind of stuff done and or get to move around red tape like that the islands are better for it i think um because they got they cleared a lot of stuff out there were piles huge massive piles of debris that they put in shopping center parking lots till they could get it cleared out just amazing sense. You know why? Because summer's coming. That clock doesn't stop ticking. And these mayors know it, you know, and that's their bread and butter. They got to get people in there. It wouldn't be the same as the summer before, but they would they would have a summer the next summer, slightly reduced summer. But they know they got it. It always reminds me of the mayor in Jaws, right? We're still opening despite the shark. <laughs> um, <laughs> they, got, they got it done. And now if you went down there, you barely see... Any sign, you'd see a lot of new houses and you'd see in restaurants, here's the Sandy Watermark. It's like a little kitschy thing now. Uh, but a lot of people were pushed out too. A lot of people couldn't afford the cost to redo their home or to raise it up. And they ended up selling. Yeah. You know, so you have that too. Kelly and I were down there just last fall and Long Beach Island. It looks beautiful. It was, you know, you, you wouldn't even know that anything had happened there. And I, I mean, I'm glad that they rebuilt and the Jersey Shore is rebuilt. What kind of lessons do you think we've learned from Sandy in New Jersey? The one thing I learned, and it's not my thought, it's like Stu Farrell, who uh, does coastal studies for Stockton University. I asked him this question. Like, I'm like, how often can we keep doing this? He said, till the money runs out. And he's so right. If, if there's a market for someone to have a house at the shore, they're going to build it. And you know what? 99.9% of the time, the shore is beautiful. We build memories. We put our feet in the sand. We play in the ocean. That's what it's about. You know, it's worth the risk. Everyone thinks it's worth the risk right now. I still think it's worth the risk. 
I absolutely will continue to vacation there. The allure of the Jersey Shore is far more powerful than the hurricanes that rip it apart because we always rebuild. When people stop caring like that or they're no longer willing to put that money in and invest, then, it, then it'll end. But I have a feeling it's going to take obliterating a lot of the shore completely to get that to happen because right now it's just chugging along full speed continuing like it nothing ever happened and that's that's good in a way and it's very new jersey right well we are rebuilding and we have rebuilt and i just love the new jersey shore as you say memories are are built there Uh, i remember vacationing as a kid i remember us being down there with our children and taking now our grandchildren down there and, and having fun at the beach. And yeah. it's just a, it's a wonderful experience. I, it's funny, you talk about the 62 storm that we used to go to, the, uh, to Lavalette. Ocean Beach is actually where we used to go as kids. Oh, Lavalette. Oh, it's the best, you know. And my dad used to take slide pictures and we would watch the slides. Well, there's a picture, I was three years old, 1961, and there's pictures at the beach in 1961. And then there's pictures of us at the beach, the same beach in 1962. And it's like July. And I'm, I'm wondering, I, how come I'm seeing all these bungalows behind me and they're not like destroyed from that storm back in March? I guess to some degree, uh, it didn't hit certain parts as hard as others down at the Jersey Shore. So it's just another sign yeah. that, you know, memories were still being created even after these storms. But I want to ask you this, Scott. How were you personally impacted today, the person you are today, by Hurricane Sandy and really the fact that you you were asked or or you were encouraged to write a book about it? How how have you been impacted by that, Scott? Well, my feelings about weather and storms haven't changed. Obviously, I don't want to see another Sandy happen in New Jersey. Of course not. I am more cognizant of the power you need to get people to listen to what's coming. Uh, I have a new respect for the weather forecasters and how they have to ride that line between what some maybe producers are saying, the hype versus what they really need to do. Gary Zakowski, the meteorologist in charge at the National Weather Service in Mount Holly, literally put out a personal plea right before Sandy telling people, this is 1962 again, because nothing else seemed to be working. It was go find someone who knows 62 and ask them if you should stay, because they're going to say no. But you know what? It gave everybody a crash course. Anyone who lived through Sandy is going to think twice now. You'll get people that say, I'll stay for anything. But a lot of people are going to think twice if they think something like that is coming up. So we have a generation of, of people who now know. For me, I am really honored to be in a position to kind of be a spokesperson for these storms. And the experience, the human experience, the natural experience, kind of like a gatekeeper of, of some of this history, because I learned from people who are the gatekeepers of history. I worked alongside of them. We worked together and documenting these storms and their history is now become my life calling in a way. You know, I, I'm a teacher by trade. That's what I do. But writing these storm books, I think probably some of the most important work I've ever done. And I always tell people, I'm not ready to write a new one. So I don't want any more storms for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I wanted to bring up one thing though, is you were asked by the authors of your favorite book as a teenager, The Great Storms of the Jersey Shore, to actually write <laughs> yeah. an additional chapter or section of that book. How did that happen? Yeah. The publisher and I were talking, Ray Fisk and I were talking, and it had been 25, almost 25 years since great storms and so much weather had happened since then uh, that the original needed a little extra info in it. So they asked me to take the helm on the new section, the second edition of great storms of the Jersey shore. Now in terms of like a weather geek, like me, that was like a baseball fan being asked to play for your favorite team. I was like, what? Thank you. You know, this was amazing. I got to hold this, it's not a franchise, but if you want to call it that, like now, in my hands and be a part of this very history that inspired me as a 16-year-old. I mean, how many people get a chance to do that? I was very well aware of how lucky and how fortunate I was to be able to do that. 
I poured my heart and soul into it, and I hope it stands the test of time just as well as the first edition did. I think Surviving Sandy and Great Storms of the Jersey Shore together give readers uh, an amazing and accurate and thorough look at Jersey Shore weather history, at least the most significant weather history. And I really am proud and will stand behind them, and I look forward to seeing how they stand the test of time. Well, you should be very proud. And uh, I understand it's a winner of four National Book Awards as well, right? Yeah, won like all sorts of things from best regional book to best cover, all <laughs> that cover I fought for. <laughs> so uh, again, team effort. It's not my book. It's Long Beach Island's book. And that's, that's Sandy. That's their history. They own it. Not me. They own that. And I'm proud to be a part of it. Being from New Jersey, uh, we're really glad to have you here and, you know, documenting an important event really in our state's history, both in its, the scale of the storm and also the courage and the resolve that the state had, the residents of, of the shore communities and also residents from other states who came in to help and you know, organizations, churches and synagogues and other organizations that were, were helping. President Carter came up and built a house in Union Beach not too long after the storm to help them rebuild. So I mean, things people did, the time they took, the resources they they used, the, the donations, unfathomable, just the scope of the volunteer and heartfelt giving that took place after Sandy. That is as significant as the storm itself. It was like a storm of love and caring that came after the storm of destruction. Uh, it doesn't get any better. And when you do a Jersey big, <laughs> it's that much more. Uh, and of course, other people, other states helped us. I, I ran into a Louisiana state trooper on Long Beach Island in his, in his patrol car that said Louisiana State Police. I said, what are you doing here? He said, you guys helped us after Katrina, so we're going to help you now. Amazing. And he was so happy to be up here. He said, everybody was so nice. I guess New Jersey has a reputation around the country. He wasn't expecting everybody to be so nice, but we were nice. So it's really good when the country comes together like that and all those power of trucks coming from Michigan and Alabama and all over the place. That's good stuff. So Sandy showed us a lot of good after the bad, which is great. Well, thank you, Scott. This has been a, a wonderful conversation. Sure. And I hope that people will be looking to get your book, actually two books that you spoke about. How can people order these books? Amazon, Barnes and Noble. You can order right from the publisher. Several real retailers at the shore, like little bookstores or little gift shops have it. But Amazon's obviously the easiest. It's out there. And uh Go get it. You know. <laughs> well, thanks again. And keep teaching those kids good stuff. And you're going to have another project coming around the corner. Hopefully it's not a another. Uh -oh, sandy. Not too soon. I don't want a Sandy, but yeah, no. please something to do with weather or history. I'd like to see that come from you, Scott. Listen, it's going to happen sooner or later. I'll get that Microsoft Word all warmed up. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So have a great evening. Okay. You too. Great talking to you. Thank you for the all opportunity. Right. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Your History, Your Story. You can connect with us on Facebook and YouTube at Your History, Your Story, or on Instagram and Twitter at YHYS Podcast. We'd love to hear from you if you have any questions, comments, or a story to tell. Be well and God bless.